Anybody got this yet? It's a number. It's a real number. Fact. More is true. It's an integer. It's negative. It had better be negative, yes. How do you know it's negative, Noah? It's in the second quadrant. There you go. It's in the second quadrant, right? Um, so if this is 1 pi over 4, this would be 2 pi's over 4, and this would be a total of 3 pi's over 4. So there's 3 pi over 4. Reference angle from here to here would be what? Uh huh. Four. Uh huh. And so then we know these lengths. One one three. And so one one it's just root one. two. And so one of these, this guy, the the height is positive. The the width, I guess, is negative. So this would be the point negative one one. And so I'm going to go ahead and put a negative like that. And so, yeah, it's adjacent over opposite, if you like. Or another way of doing it is I like to think about it as being 1 over tan, 3 pi over 4. So cotan of something is 1 over tan of that thing. And that's usually how I do it. And I just think, OK, then opposite over adjacent is 1 over negative 1, which is negative 1. So 1 over negative 1 happens to be 1 over negative 1. But anyway, it's just negative 1. That's it. Nothing, nothing tricky going on here. Just uh, think you'd be a good exercise. Okay, so today we're going to do much like what we did last time, only now we're going to be doing it with tangent, cotangent, secant, and cosecant. Um, there's just a few little things. I mean, it's, it's exactly the same stuff, right? They're functions. And so if you mess with the input, it you know, does the thing it does to the input. You mess with the output, it does the stuff it does to the output. And it's just, uh, there, there's nothing different going on here. The, only, the big difference is that, the, what's the period of tan and cotan? It's pi. It's not 2 pi. So that's, we're going to need to keep that in mind. Um, and then there's just a few little things we're going to do. So basically today we're just going to do examples from your homework. There's your homework. And on these last three, notice I say I want two periods, and I mean on the positive of x, on the positive and negative x. So what I'm talking about here is if you can make your period, one period on this side, one period on this side. Um, and I will say, I'm going to say it later at the end, but 61 and 65 are tough, and give it a shot before going to Desmos. Um, it'll probably go. Because you're gonna, but at least give it a shot and see if what you get is anything at all like decimals. I'm just looking for educated guesses with these guys here. Um, that's about all I'm gonna say there. Any questions before we begin? Okay. Another thing. So we're we're basically we're finishing up the graphs of stuff. Of course, graphs are gonna come back over and over again, right? That's like we're gonna be graphing stuff all all year. But this is gonna we're gonna kind of finish up graph stuff, and I think Thursday we are gonna do applications. So the next section after this section that we're in is all applications. But we're going to boil it down. We're not going to go crazy with applications. But I do want to, that'll round off the chapter uh, pretty well. Then we're going to go into something completely different next week. So what are applications? Applications. So applications is like just the general term for wor either word problems or, you know, whatever. Oftentimes, especially with trig, it's just like a graph of something, right? You'll have like your north, east, southwest, and you have somebody at some angle here, there's a boat and it's moving here, and you know that there's another boat and it has a different angle here, and you want to find maybe the distance between the boats or something like that, right? So that's what we mean by applications. Whenever I say applications, I'm talking either about word problems or picture problems, uh, but the way that you can actually apply all of this stuff. So not theory, kind of the opposite of theory. You're actually applying this stuff to the real world. That kind of thing. Or it could be more general. Like, here's a triangle. Like, uh, one application would be you have a triangle. You know that this is 35.7 degrees. This is one uh, when we want to find the rest. We want to find what angle is this. We want to find, maybe I think we'd have to have one other 
that actually no we wouldn't then we want to find what this is and what that is and we could do that that would be an application we'd consider that an application so we're going to do we're going to do go into doing that kind of stuff just for a day and i don't want to do too much of it um then we're going to go into something crazy next week so have fun with that uh okay there's no questions. So from your homework, you're going to have a bunch that say, find the period and sketch the graph, show asymptotes. So we're finding period and sketch graph. I'm not going to write show asymptotes, because you're always going to show your asymptotes. Right? I, that was a resounding yes, Mr. Thompson. Thanks, everybody. Okay, so we're graphing one third tan. This is number 16, by the way. You'll notice that you have both a 15 and a 17. Today's gonna to be very, very much like that. Okay, so it's exactly the same thing that we've been doing. There's, there's really no difference in the method that we're gonna use for this. Last time we were given something like this, only if it said sine, the first thing we would do is see what it does, to, what, what has happened to the input. And what we did is we would take whatever's in the input and put it between one full period, which in the case of sine and cosine was zero up to two pi. But now we have tan. So what range do we want to use, or what domain do we want to use for tan? Negative pi over two pi. Yes. You could use any one that you want as long as it's one full pi long. Just like before, if you're, if you're doing, uh, if this were sine, you could go zero to two pi. Or you could go negative pi to pi, or you could go in, you know, what, whatever, as long as it's two pi apart. You could take this from zero to pi and you'd get a perfectly good thing. But it does make sense, because when I think of tan, I think of this guy that goes, like, the, the picture I have in my head is this right here. That's what tan looks like. And he goes from negative pi over two up to pi over two. And that's the bit that repeats over and over and over again. So this is what I go to. Like I think, okay, what's going to happen to this guy when you do that to it? And so let's find out. So we go from minus pi over 2 up to pi over 2. In order to find one full period in terms of x, right? So this should be very familiar. This is your homework was this over and over again. I'm not going to go into that anymore. Let's add pi over 4 to both sides. So we have minus pi over 2, or to all sides, uh, pi over 4 less than. 2x pi over 2 plus pi over 4. What's that work out to be? 3 pi over 4 pi over 4. Yeah, I'm messing. Wait a second. What's minus pi over 2 oh. plus pi over 4? Minus pi over 4. Right. Minus pi over 4. And now what's this one? Pi, 3 pi over 4. 3 pi over 4. There we go. Okay, not quite done, we need to get that x by itself. So, there we go. And so I bring the two into the denominator, nothing happens on top, but that guy gets doubled. Ditto over here, so minus pi over eight. Now, okay, so that's one full period right there. Now, another way we could find the full period, exact same thing is true about, like if you think about this number as b, then one period is going to be something over the absolute value of b, but it's not a full 2 pi because the period of tangent isn't 2 pi, it's just plain old pi. And so in this case, the period should be pi over, in this case, 2. Now, that's part of what it said to do. Find the period. We found the period. Now what I like to do is chop this into four bits because of the way we've been graphing it, right? We find all those four things. And so, chopping this into four, if I divide that by four, what do I have? Pi over eight. So the quarter bit is pi over eight. And so I'm gonna count by pi's over eight when I go to draw this thing out. And if I do that, if I start here at minus pi over eight and then count over by pi's over eight, I should end up at three pi over eight after I've done four of them. That should, that should work. Um, so let's do that right here. So I'm going to start with a minus pi over 8, add 1 to get 0 pi's over 8, and then how about, so, 0 pi's over 8, 
1 pi over 8, 2 pi over 8, and my last one should be a 3 pi over 8. Where do the asymptotes go? Uh, the 3 pi over 8 and pi. Right, because that's what we've done, right? We started with where those two asymptotes were, right? We, and like I said, we could have started with anything as long as it's pi, the, the spread is pi. But it's kind of nice to use these two because you know that tangent's going to blow up here and here. And so it should be the case that tangent blows up, or that this new tangent blows up there and there. And let's check that. Just because I really want to drive this point home. It should be the case that when I plug in minus pi over 8 into this thing, it blows up, and let's see if that does happen. So, and notice, I'm just doing tan, I'm not worrying about the, uh, the minus, or the, the one third out in front of it. Okay, so I'm gonna plug in minus pi over eight. That gives me two on the top and the bottom. I guess that would make that minus pi over four. Is that right? Did I do that right? Yeah, okay. And so tan of minus pi over 4 minus pi over 4 is minus pi over 2. And didn't we just say that that's where tan blows up? Yeah, indeed. And it should because we know that tan is sine of stuff over cosine of stuff. And if that's minus pi over 2 that's going into there, I know that cosine comes up and goes down here at minus pi over 2. If cosine is a 0 right there, that means we're dividing by 0. Bad news, minus one. And so we get an asymptote. Okay, all right, so now stop for a second and think about what normal tangent does. So now we've, we've messed with tangent. And what I'm gonna graph first, I'm not gonna worry about that one third yet. I'm just gonna worry about this right now. Okay, so it used to be the case with all regular old tangent. You went through here at zero, shot up to infinity, shoots down to negative infinity. And it used to be the case that this was pi over two, this was negative pi over two. And since I've chopped this into four bits, we could chop this into four bits and we're gonna see. So, if I chop it here and here, exactly in the middle, I'll get pi over 4. Right here, I'll get minus pi over 4. And now we have each one of these bits. There's a bit that goes with this. There's the bit that goes with that. There's the bit that goes with that. And there's the bit that goes with that. So it should be the case that this guy right here goes through, comes up, and then shoots up like that down, shoots down like that. Now, when I plug in pi over 4 into tangent, what is my output? Oh. Oh. One. Tan of pi over 4 is indeed 1, right? Because if we think about what this triangle, pi over 4, 1, 1, root 2, tan is opposite over adjacent, 1 over 1 is 1, the output's one. And you see, the thing is, and this is not drawn very well, but there's my negative one. Ditto with negative pi over four, only now it's negative one. Now it used to be the case that when you'd stretch, like when we were doing sines and cosines, they had a finite range, right? They only went from one to negative one. So when you stretch them, it's pretty obvious which point you want to label. But if I go to try to stretch or compress this guy vertically, it's not really gonna change that picture. I mean, I guess if I wanted to, I could draw it flatter if I'm compressing it, which is what that would be, right? We take all of the heights, multiply them by a third, it brings everybody down by a factor of three, brings everybody up by a factor of three, but that's gonna look terrible, <laughs> right? And so, what we're gonna do, <coughs> You know, because I, I could take this, and let's just say I wanted to compute. So this is tan x. That's what tan x would look like. And then if I wanted to do one third tan x, I could, if I were so inclined, draw it flatter like that, and flatter like that. 
Or I could just take these interesting points, there's two points right there, and then just write them as a third, couldn't I? And that's the nice thing about, so it used to be when it was sine and cosine, you know it went up to one and down to negative one. And so if there's a one third in front of it, you know it's going up to one third and down to negative a third. With tangent, let's pick a point that gives us out a one in the same, in the same kind of, in the same spirit here, right? That's going to make our lives easier. And so now, I mean, I could go through and label this. And in fact, I might want to do that. I want to, might want to go ahead and label that as a one right there. Because, right? Like, it's the same, I'm using the same facts that we've been using, that if you've chopped it into four pieces, then once you've stretched it, what happens carries over to the stretch, right? So, or, I'm sorry. This would be a vertical, this is, this is a horizontal compression by a factor of two. And so each of these, and it's been shifted, yes, but each one of these distances, say from here, is going to preserve that property. So that when you plug in a pi over four with tangent, you get out of one. And so it's the case when you plug in a two pi over eight, and you could check if you plug that in, two pi over eight, 2 pi over 8 times 2 would be 4 pi over 8, or how about pi over 2 minus pi over 4 gives you a pi over 4. So what you're computing here, when you plug in a 2 pi over 8, you do that little, you actually compute it, and you're doing the same thing as pi, tan of pi over 4. Everybody follow that? I said that pretty quick, but you know what I'm saying, right? So, so I could label that as a 1. And now, the, one of the nice things here is this takes care of, of that point. We know where that goes down to because of, by the symmetry here, right? Where once we've divided this into four places, you go over one-fourth to here, and you're in the same place that you were right here, down at negative one. But now, when you take it and multiply it by one over three, now you've just taken that and shrunk it down to a third, and you've shrunken that down to a third, negative one. Does that make sense? Well, I just did. Yeah. Right? I said that pretty quick. But I didn't need to draw the tangent and the ones and then redraw everything in this case. We're going to see one where we will need to redraw it, and you'll see why in a minute. Or, I mean, you could try to anticipate all of the shifts and everything. That's fine too, but that's the idea. That's what we have right there. Now, if we didn't have one that went through right there, we would then need to actually plug it in and see. And let's pretend for a second that we didn't know what that was. How would we find that y-intercept? Set it to zero. Set what to zero? The, the one-third tan. Like, just say that. Oh, no, plug in is zero. Plug in is zero, right? Because we're trying to find the output value. And we know that the input value, if this is my x, the input value right here is 0. And let's just do that to finally, we're just going to check all the work that we've done with this picture. Because I feel like I'm done now. But that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to graph it. Showing the asymptotes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so let's just check and make sure that when we plug in a 0 for x, we do get out minus 1 third. So 1 third tan of 2 times a big fat 0 minus a quarter. That guy's gone. He's one third tan of minus a quarter. And then I know that if you plug in tan of minus a quarter, you get out a negative one. So that's one third times negative one is negative one third. And so yes, my output when I plug in a zero should be minus one third. So we had two ways of getting that. It's nice when you have two ways of getting something you're drawing because then you could go back and check your work if you've done it one way. So there you go. Like I said, it's, it's very, very similar to what we've been doing. I'm going to say for this homework, if your picture that you have spans across the y-axis like this does, then just draw one. You're fine. If you have one that's over here, then draw the next one that brings you back over the origin. Okay. So if you had done all of this, so like for instance, if the shift were greater, right? If it were minus like seven pi over four and you ended up with a picture that looked like this, I would like to see you do the next one over. 
It might, I don't know, I haven't looked at all of them. I mean, I've looked at all of them, but I haven't done all of them. You might have one that's even further out. Go ahead and do it. Just, I, I, just keep do as many as you need until you get one that spans over here as well, okay? And then plot, like, mark the wine. Okay. Yeah, and so another thing, I, I'm, yes, this, always, always do Y intercepts. And if it comes out to be something like cosine, whatever, cosine of 7 pi over 11, just that's the answer. It goes through at cosine of whatever 7 pi over 11 is. We don't know what, what that is. We happen to know that tangent of this stuff equals that stuff. If it's something really ugly, just label it as that. Questions? What's the amplitude? So there, there is no amplitude. We can't define, well, I mean, I guess you probably could define an amplitude, Infinity. but that's not part of one of the things they say, right? So, and like I said before, if I were to draw this stretched, <laughs> you know, like, you would look like that, and that's kind of the, that's kind of the thing. What I want to see on all of these, though, is that you, you, I would say for tangent and cotangent, you find the input value that would have given you a 1 just like we did here just a second ago. Yeah. Like, and that's how we're going to take care of, we're not gonna draw it stretched and compressed. They're always gonna look like this. It's just a matter of, all, you, know, you know that halfway between here and here is the output value of one. And so then, if you've then taken that and multiplied it by a third, then you brought it down to a third. And that's what you're showing right here with these points. So in every one of these that you draw, you should have, at least in the first one that you do, I'm not going to demand that you do that for every single one, but at least in the first one you do, you've labeled what point that is and what point that is. That's how we're going to show the amplitude, although we don't call it amplitude when it comes to tangents and stuff like that. So, does that make sense? Yeah. Cool? Okay. Okay. Um, That's not where I wanted to say that. That's where I wanted to say that. Okay, let's say that now. Okay, so where's the new one? So. Same setup, fine period, sketch graph. This is number 26, and it's y equals third code minus one third cotan of three x minus pi. Now, we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna take care of the input first. But what do I wanna put it between? Think about cotan. Wait, is it zero? Zero and pi is what I would use. Because the graph of cotan, the only thing I remember about the graph of cotan is that it comes down and goes like this. And then I think, well, if tangent has a period of pi, then cotan has a period of pi. And so it must be that this guy goes through here, pi. And if that's pi, halfway from there to there must be pi over two. That's how I keep cotan in my head. And of course, this is also an asymptote. I'm not going to care if you, I mean, it's just, you know, whatever. I mean, if you've already drawn a y-axis and you're showing it going towards the y-axis, we're cool. Um, okay, so this is what regular old cotan looks like. This is cotan x. And I say, let's just take this one. We could take any one of them that we want. If we were so inclined, we could put it from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. We could take negative pi over 2, pi over 2. And then this is the picture that we would be redrawing. That just seems like a huge pain to me. Let's just use one full line or curve, you know. And so my intuition says the best way of tackling this is to go from 0 to pi. If you want to have fun, <laughs> you could do it a different way and see what happens. It's going to get ugly, but that's cool. So let's get the x by itself. We'll add pi to... The outsides giving me a pi, 3x, pi plus pi is 2 pi. 
Dividing through by 3 gives me pi over 3, x, 2 pi over 3. Okay. So now, basically, we've taken this and we've seen that, okay, we're going to shift it over and squash it a little bit, or maybe we're not squashing, I can't tell. But that's the idea. It's going to move over some. Now let's find the period. In this case, what's the period of cotan? Pi. And so it's pi over what? B. Over B, which is what in this case? Three. 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 Okay. So that's part of your answer right there. Now let's take a quarter of that. Because that's I, every time I do these, I want to do it by, I want to quarter, take a full period and quarter it. Because for all of these guys, cotan, tan, Sine, cosine, all of them, all of them, they all have interesting things that happen every quarter of a period, right? With sine and cosine, you're either at a zero, a max, a zero, or a min, right? For tangent, you're either at zero, you're at one, or you shot off to infinity, or the other way around, right? And so, same thing applies. I'm going to take this, divide it by four, and get pi over 12. So I'm going to count by pi's over 12. And so what I'm going to do, the way I like to do it, I'm, I know that I'm starting at pi over 3, uh, but what I want to do is say, since I'm counting by 12's, let's convert the pi over 3 into something over 12. What's pi over 3? 4 over 12. Right. 4 pi over 12 is pi over 3. So I'm going to start there. And I'm going to count by pi is over 12. So 4 pi over 12, 5 pi over 12, 6 pi over 12, 7 pi over 12, 8 pi over 12. And is 8 pi over 12 the same thing as 2 pi over 3? Yes, it is. So now I feel confident that I've done this the right way. I should have an asymptote here and an asymptote here. And if I wanted, if we had more time, I would go ahead and just plug those bad boys in. And we'd see that, yeah, one of them's going to give you a zero. If you plug in 4 pi over 12 into there, you'll get a zero. Plug in 8 pi over 12. But I mean, we, that's just what we did. <laughs> that's exactly what we did. Pretend that's an equal sign, and you'll see that when x is equal to that, you get a zero. Pretend that's an equal sign, and you'll see that when this is equal to banana, blah, 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 blah. Okay? So, okay, so. Cotan doesn't go this way, it goes the opposite way. He comes down from above, goes through, and does that. Like that. So what I've just drawn right now is cotan 3x minus pi. Now we need to figure out, and this is indeed a negative one third. Okay, so what is multiplying it by a negative something going to do to this? Flip it, which, this way? Vertical. Vertical, right. It's going to flip it that way. Now, it used to be the case, and we could just, if you, really, if you believe me here, we could just say, when you're halfway between here and here, your output's 1. When you're halfway between here and here, your output's negative 1. This is how we're going to, take, how we're going to deal with the amplitude. And now you can see what I meant by, like, sometimes, you could just label that, like, if, if we were done here, I would just say, well, then one third would be what happens when this gets shrunk down to a third, that gets shrunk down to a third, but now it's negative. So we already said it's going to flip it, right? <laughs> and since I'm running out of room, I don't want to redraw this again, but I would redraw it. I would get exactly the same picture, but instead of coming down from above, we're going to be flipping this, and so it should go up. It, uh, it doesn't it look like tangent. I mean, it's been it's been flipped around, or I mean, it's been stretched and compressed and all that. Cause, cause, wait. And so this would be what I've just drawn here is negative cotan of that, right? So that the ones haven't changed. But now we don't want negative cotan. We want negative a third cotan. So I'm going to go negative one third cotan is what I get when I then shrink this down to a third and that down to negative a third. Now you'll notice 
we're not, we're not, we're off, <laughs> right? Like, what, I would like to see another one over here. So let's go ahead and do that. We know we're counting by pi's over 12, so let's count backwards. 4 pi over 12 down to 3 pi over 12 down to 2 pi over 12 down to 1 pi over 12 and then 0 pi over 12. I said you don't need to do this, but that's where it would be, right? And so now it's just the same picture, but it's been repeated. The middle point is this guy comes up, goes down. Here at pi over 12, we're down at minus a third. Here, there, we're at there, just like that before. Now, I said we wanted both sides of this. This is fine. If, if your thing butts up against the x or the y-axis, you're done. I just want to, I would like you to at least take it to the y-axis. Or almost. <laughs> we're in the limit, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, we're approaching. We are approaching the y-axis as x goes to zero. So, <clears throat> questions? Like I said, this is just this is the same stuff. It's that we're doing the exact same thing with these graphs. The only difference is what the graphs look like, and the period for cotan and tan are diff are different by a factor of two. Doesn't ask for the phase. What now? It doesn't ask for the phase shift. Um, you could define it the same way if you wanted to, right? It could be the same thing. Um, I, don't, I don't think it asks for it. If it does ask for it, you know what to do, right? <laughs> but I don't think it does. And I don't think, see, phase shift, that right there, implies a, a sine wave or a cosine wave. So, yeah, like phase, to talk about the phase of something, usually you're talking about a sine or a cosine wave. Now this is periodic, and you could talk about a phase shift, although it's just, I've never heard someone talk about phase with respect to cotan, tan, secant, and cosecant. Though I wouldn't be surprised if, if there were, it's just I've never heard that. Um, so there you go. Questions before I erase this guy? Okay. Now, Actually, no. You said you said that this looks a lot like tangent, doesn't it? And yeah, could number fifty-four. No, I'm sorry. Number fifty-three. It says find an equation using cotangent that has the same graph as tangent. So you could imagine how you could take cotangent, do some manipulations to it, to turn it into the graph of cotangent. I mean, the graph of tangent. It's like you cosine plus pi over two whatever you equals sine. There you go, right? And so, and so just okay. figure out, like I think we already know the big thing we need to do to make it look like, right? I mean. The difference between cotan and tan is this, this thing, this reflection. So that's an easy way to start off, or maybe an easy way to finish. But then you notice also that that's not in the right place. So you need to figure out how to move it. Pretty simple, pretty simple stuff. Um, yeah, there's, not, there's really not much to say on that. But I just want to let you know that's how you're going to do it. Or it's, it's the same idea here. Okay, one more of these kind. So number 36. Find period and sketch graph of y equals one half secant 2x minus Again, let's start with the inputs. That's what I want to do. I want to find my new period. Well, one full period of this guy. And so for secant, I'm going to go between what and what? Uh, two pi. Zero, zero and two, two pi. pi. Why not, right? If you want, you could do negative pi to pi. That's fine. I'm going to do it this way. Whatever. I don't care. But it needs to be a total of two pi long. And so getting x by itself, I need to add 
pi over 2 over here. Now, 2 pi is the same thing as 4 pi over 2. So 4 pi over 2 plus 1 pi over 2 should be 5 pi over 2. Did I do that right? Yeah. I didn't even look at my notes. Nice. Okay. Now I'm going to divide through by 2 and give, to give me pi over 4 x 5 pi over 4. Okay. So that's my new one full period of secant. So let's find the actual period. What divided by what? Oh, yeah, it is two pi. Mm -hmm. And so in this case, it's just pi. There you go. So nothing different with secant and cosecant. They're just like sine and cosine. Now, a quarter of that, well, that's easy. The quarter that we're looking for, the quarter, the step size that we're looking for is pi over 4. So we're going to start at pi over 4 and count by pi's over 4 until we get to 5 pi over 4, and hopefully that everything, everything matches up and works out. So, starting at pi over 4, we go 1 pi over 4, 2 pi over 4, 3 pi over 4, 4 pi over 4, finally 5 pi over 4 should be one full period. And yes, that's where it told me to end, so I feel good about this. Now, secant. The way I deal with secant is I first think of what cosine looks like, and then I flip it, right? And so cosine, since we're starting, our, our period starts here, where should I start for, for if, I were, if I were drawing cosine, I would put a dot where? Here, at here, one. or here, at 1, right? Because cosine starts at 1, comes down, and so it would look like this. And if you don't need to do this part, that's fine. You could just kind of see where you're going with this. That's cool too. But I like to have that visual right there. And so now I know that wherever cosine hits the x-axis, that's where we're going to have an asymptote. Right? Because we're dividing by cosine. Secant is 1 over cosine. And so it's going to do this. Okay? And so then secant is the thing that just flips this guy up. The point that's at 1 stays put, and he goes up like this. The point that's at negative 1 stays put. I'm going to label that negative 1. He stays put, and he goes down like that, down like that. This guy comes up like that. Now, a few different ways I could do this. I, seeing that now I'm not going to have any kind of crazy flips or anything like that, Right? Like this, it's not going to be a vertical flip. There's not going to be a vertical shift. And so this essentially is the same picture I'm going to end up with. The only difference is I'm ultimately going to take the outputs and multiply them by something, which is going to have the effect of either stretching or compressing. So I'm just going to keep this picture here. I just need to continue it on this way. And seeing that my step size is pi over 4, I'm just going to keep counting. I'm going to go, OK, so 1 pi over 4, 0 pi over 4, minus pi over 4, minus 2 pi over 4. Let's see, 1, 2, 3, and then finally minus 3 pi over 4. Cosine would have done this. He would have come down here, back up, like that. So that means my new asymptotes are here. I'm not going to bother drawing the one on the y-axis, but I will draw this one here. And now I'm just going to continue. This guy goes up. This guy goes down. That's nowhere near where it should be. <laughs> you guys see that? I should have brought him all the way down to minus 1, right? Right? Like, I should have done that. I did that terribly. I should have brought him down the same way I brought him down and up. OK, there we go. So he stays here at negative 1 and shoots down like that. And this is what I mean. We want to try to span, have a span across the, the y-axis when we do this. So what I've just drawn right here is just plain old co, no, not co anything. It's just secant. 
2x minus pi over 2. That's what this thing is. We'll just divide the... Right, so now we're taking all the outputs and we're going to multiply every output by 1 half. Qualitatively, that doesn't shift, that doesn't change the graph. We don't <coughs> need to actually draw it any closer. We're just going to say, well, these points that were at negative 1 is now at negative 1 half. The, point that were, the points that were at positive 1 are now at positive 1 half. And this is the kind that you can do that with, right? And I'm kind of anticipating. After you do like three or four of these, you'll get a sense of, okay, I could look at this and see. I'm not going to need to redraw the whole thing in order to do this. The previous one we did, right? And like, because there was a flip and stuff like that, you could try to just go for it all in one fell swoop. That's cool too, but I, I don't trust myself to do it right unless I take the steps. Working from the inside out, right? Working, starting with the input stuff, figure out where my new stuff is, and then work my way out to what happens to the outside. Okay. Are there up, going to be up and down shifts? I don't think in this homework there are. I, it wouldn't be hard, I mean, at least for these problems here, I think they go up to 47. I don't think that there are any up and down shifts, but if there were, if this were plus one, we'd know what to do. We have everything up to this point. Now we just need to take all of these points, shift them up by one, so it would move from this would move from minus one half up to positive one half. Move the axis. It would just right. It would just move everything. And so what you could do is then just erase it. Just make that a dotted line and say, well. If that moved up, then that is where it should be, right? And okay. so on and so forth. And you would need to call that then positive one half oh. plus one would be then three halves. Yeah. That's how you could do it. Um, yeah. In this case, there's no y-intercept. You'll notice, and you could check that if you're like, wait, am I sure there's no y-intercept? Let's plug in a zero and find out. We get one half secant, that's a big fat zero, so I'm not going to worry about it, minus pi over two, which is the same thing as one half times one over cosine of negative pi over two. Yeah. That's one over zero, so that's one over two times zero, which is one over zero, so there is no y-intercept. If it intercepts, it intercepts at infinity, whatever that means, so we have to wait for complex analysis for that. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Questions. Okay. Ah. So there's another type of problem in this homework set. Like everything we're doing now. Now, you'll notice we're not really learning anything new. We're just practicing how to manipulate these graphs, which I cannot tell you how useful this is in a wide variety of stuff. So it's not like we're wasting our time with busy work here. This is really good practice, being able to graph this kind of stuff. This kind of stuff, not so much, but it's kind of fun. So watch this. This is graph this. Actually, it, it, is, it is actually quite important. The absolute value of cosine x minus 3. So just forget the negative part. I'm not going to forget it. So first off, so let's just, just think. So obviously, this is some function. Whatever it is, it, it is some, you have an input-output relationship. You can think about this as f of x minus 3. If we know what f of x is, we'll just take it and shift it down by a total of 3. So really, all of this is like, we just need to figure out what this thing looks like. And let's, real quick, just think about this. Let's say we have a function f of x equals the absolute value of x. What does that look like? It's just a line, but line segment from zero. Um, I, yeah. what, is the, what is f of negative 1? What is f of negative 2? Ah, it does have outputs. You're saying just forget about it. No, we're 
not forgetting about it. Whenever the normal graph, so the graph of, F, of just x comes down, you basically, you just take whatever's down here and you reflect it up like that. And so, yeah, it's you take, you pretend for a second that you're graphing the thing that's not absolute value. And so that would be g of x right here. And then to find f, you take whatever is down here and you just make him positive. So if you're down here at negative 2, you make it positive 2. If you're down here at negative 5, you make it positive 5. And so graphically or geometrically what you've done is you've just taken all the negative parts and you've made them positive. And let's, I want to do one more just to really drive this point home. We'll talk about it. So let's say we have, we want to graph this guy. Yeah, let's just do this. X minus one. So what I'm going to think about first to say, well, hold up, let's forget about the absolute value and let's just think about what a function x minus one looks like. Well, it would be like g of x equals x, but then you just shift him down by one. And so he does this type of thing. So this would be my g of x right here. He goes through at negative one. Also goes through here at positive one. Oh. Right? So you're adding to the output there. And because it's not friends. Wait. Well, now we're just saying take, take whatever output that was and now make it positive. And so now, instead of being down here at minus one, right? So it used to be I'd plug in a zero and I would get a zero minus one is minus one. That's why g of x ends up down there. But now when I plug it in, I get f of zero is absolute value of zero minus one, which is the absolute value of minus one, which is just positive one. So it takes it, and again, just like I said, it just flips it up. Used to be the case that when I plug in a negative 3 into here, I get negative 3 minus 1 is negative 4. So I plug in my negative 3, get out of minus 4. Now, f says, well, you just take whatever that is, minus 3 minus 1, minus 4, and just make it positive. So literally, you just take whatever's down here and you flip it up. You reflect it, right? So you just, which just shifts it over. Yeah. Right, one by one. Like, yeah, and that's another thing. Because you can think about the, per, the first one that we did, we just took the input, minus off one from the input, and it shifted it to the right. Both out the absolute value or your the output. Yeah. Or you could think about it like this. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's the thing about linear ones. It's like, are you adding to the input or yeah. adding to the output? Well, in the, linear, in the linear case, especially if there's no slope, it could go either way. You get the same thing. Whether I shift it over by one or shift it down by one, there's no difference in the case of f of x is x. So, yeah. Yeah, that's weird. yeah I know. I know. Yeah. But yeah, so, okay. So now let's do cosine. Same kind of thing. We're trying to figure out what this looks like. So in order to do it, I'm going to first look at regular old cosine and say, okay, I know what regular old cosine looks like. I'm going to do them in a different color. We're going to do G in pink. The thing I don't care about, I'm going to do in pink. We know cosine does this, starts up here at 1, goes down, comes back up, goes down, comes back up. Okay. And so now, I'm just going to take, when you then take the absolute value of it, everything that's negative just simply becomes positive. Right? right? So it used to be that this point was down at negative 1. Now you're going to, right, because, and let's just think about what, where these are. This is pi over 2. This is pi. This is 3 pi over 2. This is 2 pi. It used to be that you plug in a pi and you get out a negative 1. Because cosine of pi is equal to negative 1. Now when you take the absolute value of it, it just pops it back up. It comes up to positive 1. Ditto with all these other points. If they're negative, they just pop, become positive. So what you end up with is something that looks like this. We're just popping all these guys up. It just pops back up, something like that. 
And so, the one, the, this height hasn't changed. We're still one. But now, nothing down here goes below zero. Just something to note when we go to do this, because now we're going to shift it by three. We're going to take all these outputs and bring them down by three. And so what we should end up with, and let's just think. So I know it's going to do this type of thing, right? these arches. And now if we were up at one, if I subtract three, I would go down to zero, minus one, minus two. So I'm here at minus two. That's where my humps start. And here, I'm gonna go ahead and label pi over two, pi, three pi over two, two pi. What if the minus three were inside of the pi? That would be, well, mm -hmm. so let's do that, okay. So minus pi over two, minus pi, minus three pi over two, and minus two pi. What's this right here? Minus three. Minus oh, three. Yeah. minus three, right? You think, oh, the cosine it has a span of two or whatever. Nope, not nope, because we're taking this right here from zero and we're bringing them down. So there you go, there's your graph. Now, that's a good question, so let's do this. Okay, so that's that's 58. Still be adding to them out but now let's do this. So let's do it the same way we did before, right? The the function we care about is cosine x minus three, and we take the absolute value. So we're first going to think about what it's like if there's no absolute value. Okay, so cosine x minus three just takes cosine x and shh, brings them down by a factor of. 3, and so he was up here from 1 to negative 1, but he comes down to 3, so it would be starting here at 2, going down like that, etc. And now down to, oh, it's a minus 2, that should be a minus 4. Everybody buy that? Yeah. Now we're taking this and just making it positive. We're literally, we're just going to flip it up. And so, right, right, it used to be the case that you're here, your output was a negative four. So you throw in some value and you got out a negative four. Now you're just gonna take it, take the absolute value of it, make it positive. Now he just pops up to positive four. And so, so it's the same picture, only now like flipped, right? Oh. Flipped this way, so he starts at minus two. that, like that, up like that, like that, and up to positive four. That minus, and what am I talking about? Positive. Like sign now. Kind of, well, no, because you still have a min right there. Sign would have to start right here. Oh, yeah. Oh. yeah. So that would be the same thing as negative cosine plus, this should be the same thing as negative cosine x. Right, Flip. And then plus one, two, three. Yeah, plus three. Yeah. But anyway, that's yeah. Weird. So that's, yeah. Yeah. Um, plus three. Yeah, plus three. Okay, so don't get that in your head and be like, oh, if it's absolute value, I just flip the signs. No, not necessarily. Not necessarily. It happened to work out that way for this one. But it's the method that you go through. You first draw the thing, and then you take whatever's beneath the x-axis and just flip it up. It's that simple. Like visually, that's what we're doing. Does that make sense why that's the case? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. One last thing to talk about. <laughs> okay, so. sign and multiplying it by some function or t 
taking cosine and multiplying it by some function. We're talking about the output now. So you imagine, you imagine what the graph of that thing looks like. Now what we're going to do is take it and multiply it by a function. So you're taking the outputs and multiplying the outputs by some function. This is called a damped, damp, like we're dampening, damped sign. This is called a damped cosine. Okay. That's just what it's called. It's just now you know. That's what it's called. So here's an example. Suppose we want to graph. Let's say that we want to graph this function g of x is equal to e to the negative x <laughs> times Wait, do we need natural sine x? No. No, 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 because no. you're going to see something. We're going to see something. I'm, gonna, I'm going to teach you this. This is what I'm going to teach you something. Now, here's, this is, your book does this. It's so slick. I loved it. I was like, oh, that's... I really like this. This is cool. So now I know we just talked about the absolute value of functions and stuff like that. This isn't exactly like we're, we're about to take the absolute value of this, but not because we're trying to graph it with absolute value or anything like that. It's just to show you something pretty cool here. So don't think that, okay, in order to do this, we need to get an absolute value. No, this is to, to prove something. Watch what happens when I do this. If I take the absolute value of this one, well, that's the same thing as the absolute value of this entire thing. Right? That's, that's all that means. Right? You're just taking the absolute value of something. Now, it turns out to be the case that the, so the absolute value of A times B is the same thing as the absolute value of A times the absolute value of B. Do you believe that? Yeah. Right? Because, like, if one of them were negative, it doesn't, it, it doesn't matter. Like, everybody's going to be positive in the end, right? So, like, if you had negative 2 times 3 and you took the absolute value, it's the exact same thing as if you took the absolute value here, right? Yeah. There's no difference, right? So, so, okay, you have something times something. Well, then the absolute value is simply the absolute value of 1 times the absolute value of the other. So, the absolute value of e to the negative x times the absolute value of sine x. Now here's where we make our money, right here. What's the very biggest that sine could ever be? One. one. Never gets bigger than one, does it? Ever. Like there's no possible way to throw something into sine and make it bigger than one. So no matter what, this value here has to be less than or equal to a big fat one. It could never get bigger, can it? Like this is, at the most, this is what we have. Everybody follow that? Okay, well then something times 1 is just whatever that something is. e to the negative x. Oh, because it goes through. Oh. Now, e to the negative x, is that ever negative? No, because it just flips. Well, let's, just, let's think about what e to the negative x looks like real quick. E to the negative x does this, and it shoots up. Goes That's through here at 1. Is this like the 2.17 e, or is it like the graph? Of course, there's no other e. This is like Euler's e. number. Yeah, e. E. This is, this is our best friend, e. The most important number in mathematics, e. OK? So since he's always positive, then the absolute value is the same thing. Like, think about it. If, if I said, to now draw the absolute value of that, you get, well, it's the same thing. Yeah. Like it's, there's no, it's like saying, what's the absolute value of 2? Well, it's just 2. <laughs> like, it's, it's 2. It hasn't changed. It's, it's the same thing as that you put in there. Same thing for this. Since e to the negative x is always positive, this is just e to the negative x, yeah? yeah? So, okay, what have we just found out? That this function, g of x, the absolute value of the function we care about, is always less than or equal to e to the negative x. Now, if you remember, this is like from day one of last year. If we have the absolute value of something is less than some number, or less than or equal to some number, that means the same thing as to say that it's bounded by plus or minus that number. No, yeah, yeah. Remember? 
right? Because let's think about this. If x is, if the absolute value of x is less than 2, well, it could be negative 1. Could x be negative 1? Yeah. Yeah, because the absolute value of negative 1 is just 1. Is that less than 2? Yeah. Yeah. What about, can it be negative 1.9? Is the absolute value of that less than 2? Yeah. yeah. In fact, all the numbers between negative 2 and 2 will work there. That's what, that's what this means right here, right? And you take 0, does 0 work? Yes. What about 1.5? Yeah, it, yeah, it works, right? So that's what this is. And we could say the same thing is true here. And this is where this, is where this all pays off. We could say, okay then. G of x is bounded by e to the x and by negative e to the negative x. Negative. negative. And so, in other words, e to the x looks like, I mean, sorry, e to the negative x looks like this. This guy right here is e to the negative x. So negative e to the negative x would be what I get when I flip this guy down, right? We're taking a function, multiplying it by negative 1. It just flips it down like that. And this guy right there is negative e to so the negative x. And so sine, it's, it, this is sine, but it has been basically compressed in this direction. It gets compressed, and this is, this is what it does, actually. So it goes until it hits where it used to be 1. It used to be the case that at pi over 2, it would be 1. And so when you plug in a pi over 2 into here, you get g of pi over 2 is equal to e to the negative pi over 2 times sine of pi over 2, which we know is 1, right? Yeah. Sine of pi over 2 is 1. And so you just get out, well, whatever this was here. We already had this function drawn. Whatever it was is just that height. But notice that whenever sine is less than that, it, it doesn't get quite, it doesn't get all the way up there. Right? Here he goes at pi. Plug in a pi, you get e of negative pi, whatever that happens to be, times zero, because sine of pi is zero, and you get a zero. And you keep going. I'm going to try to draw this a little bit. So just, but it can't go. Oh, and then on the, oh, wait. And so this is what this means. Oh. Yeah, and so this is what this means. That the function that we're drawing, g of x, which is this guy, he's, he, he behaves just like sine, but his height gets the, damped. This is why it's called a damped. Oh. Uh, Etc. Oh, that should be 2 pi right there. That's but on the pi. left side, it's just the same, right? Well, yeah, but now look, it gets yeah. bigger. Yeah, okay. it's, it's kind of the opposite of dampening, but usually when you see these things... Oh, so it can get to the one? Oh, yeah, well, think about it. Think oh. about it. Let's plug in a negative uh, 3 pi over 2. Wait, it comes down. Yeah, at negative 3 pi over 2, regular old sine is at 1, right? Everybody buy that? Yeah. And so what happens to g of x? Well, let's, let's figure it out. g of negative 3 pi over 2 is the same thing as e to the negative negative 3 pi over 2 times sine of negative 3 pi over 2. We already said that that thing is 1. So we get e to the negative negative is the same thing as 3 pi over 2 times a big fat 1. And so now he's going to go all the way up and touch that guy, wherever he lives. Right. Yeah. And touch that one point right there and then start falling back down. And it will go on infinitely. And it will go on infinitely. Because this guy, this part of it is just bouncing between 0 and 1. But this guy, as we go back that way, is taking off, right? So it's approaching zero, it's approaching infinity and negative infinity. Yeah. Yeah, it'll bounce back and forth forever, going from as big as you like to as negative as you like. That's weird. 
pretty cool one. And so this also, by the way, this, this is called an envelope. You'll hear that in, uh, if you do anything with like audio mixing or something like that, there, like you could have an audio signal and there'll be different kinds of envelopes you could put on it. And this is the, it, very much stuff like this. So like, if you're listening to a you know, track of music or whatever and it fades out at the end, this is what they're doing. They're putting an envelope on it. They're taking the signal that you originally had, your, your, your music, basically, and they're saying, and as time goes on, we're going to decay. It's going to come down. And there's different shapes of envelopes. This is one of them. E to the negative x is an envelope right there. That's what it does. Pretty cool, huh? But you couldn't really have e to the x or just get infinitely loud. You couldn't do, yeah, you would. Well, I mean, you could, and the, the, you break speakers and all that, but no, right, yeah. You don't want to do that. And so it's usually called dampening because in practice, you're making it smaller. As you go into negative time, you know, but usually it gets smaller as you go. But you could make it bigger. I mean, you, look, like what if I, instead of said negative x, I said e to the x, well, it would just be this, just flipped around, and it would get bigger and bigger as you go on. What if you did x squared times? Times. Sorry. Let's do that. And let's see what that one looks like. So, same thing applies that we did before. So, okay. So the same the same result holds here that g of x is bounded by the plus of this stuff and the negative of this stuff, right? The only difference between what we had on the board before and what we have now is that I just changed this one symbol, right? And it used to be e to the negative x and negative e to the negative x, but we still have this. And so our envelope would be positive x squared, which looks like this, and negative x squared, that looks like this. And now you're just taking that, that's the max that you could, that's, that's as big as it could get. It can't get any bigger than this, it can't get any smaller than this. And the only time it's actually going to make it all the way up to there is when sine itself is either 1 or negative 1. Yeah. Right? So as you go, um, let's see, if this is, let's, do, let's try to do, this looks like 1. Okay, so pi over 2 is, should be bigger than 1. Yeah, yeah, it should be, because 2 is bigger than pi. Or, I mean, 2 is smaller than pi. Um, it's also less than, is it less than 2? Yeah, no. Wait. Yes. Yes, because pi is less than 4. So, it's, so pi over 2 is between 1 and 2. So we reach our max at some point here. And it'll do something like this. What is it doing before that? Well, good question. I don't know. But that's where it first touches. It's not going to touch before that. Well, it's going to touch at zero. Because both yeah. sign and that are zero at zero. But then it should come down and go up and touch. That's the hard part. I would not expect you to be able to figure that out. But then it's going to start getting smaller. It's going to start getting bigger. And then it's going to start getting smaller. And it's just going to follow this envelope out. Right? And it should do the same thing on the other side. It should touch and then come down and go up and go down and go up. Right? And we'd be able to say, and I didn't draw this very well, but this should be at pi, this should be at 3 pi over 2, this should be at 2 pi, and so on and so forth. What? On the left when it go down. Oh yeah, 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 thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, it would, it would, it would go down. Excellent, excellent catch. Right, it would touch right there, but it wouldn't touch before that. And it would move the opposite way, and then come back down. Yes, good, catch. I completely missed that. Right, so this would be not at negative one, it would be at negative pi over two. This would be at negative pi. This height would be at negative Two, negative two pi, and so on. 
And so yeah. Woo. Does that make sense why this works? Like it's only going to touch, because as this thing bounces between zero or negative one and one, it's only, like when, when, it's, when it's one, it's the exact same thing as this. It happens to be one here at pi over two, and so that's where it's going to touch that. Any other time, this thing's less than one. Yeah. And so it's going to be smaller. You take a number, however big it is, like you plug in a two and you get a four, but then you multiply that by something smaller than one, and it's going to be smaller, right? And so on and so forth. And so until finally, like, you get to pi, and you're taking something and multiplying it by zero, well, and so on and so forth, and you're at negative one, that would be at, what, three pi over two? So g of three pi over two, you get... 3 pi over 2 squared times sine of 3 pi over 2, which is, I guess, 9 pi squared over 4 times negative 1. And you get whatever you would have gotten if you plugged in the thing. That's where it finally touches. But then, as you keep going, now it gets bigger. In other words, sine has now shrunk in magnitude you're not going to be able to get all the way down to the x squared. But you will get to the x squared whenever sine is equal to either 1 or negative 1, which happens only at those points, and so on and so forth. And so you're not just stretching. This is different from stretching it by a constant amount or compressing it by a constant amount, because you start off by compressing when it's smaller than 1. And then once you get past 1, now you're stretching. But it changes as time goes on. And so that's called, this, you could also call this an envelope. Your book doesn't say anything about that. That's just what it's called, especially in sound en engineering. Um, but this right here is called a damped sign. It doesn't look like it's being damped, does it? But, <laughs> you know, that's usually when it's used, it's, it, it is like in the first case where it's becoming smaller and smaller in magnitude. That's how it, that's how it works. And in fact, that comes up in the damped harmonic oscillator. When you take physics, yeah. So when you take physics, when you first do it, you're going to learn how to, let's say you have a spring and a weight on the end of a spring of some mass m. And let's say it's at rest right there. Now let's say what I do is I pull it down a little bit and let it go. Well, what's going to happen? It's going to, it's going to start low. It's going to pop up and go down and go up. Or let's say that I just take it right here, and at time zero, at time zero, the mass is right there, and I give it a little shove. What's going to happen? Well, you could, there's, there are certain formulas for the force and springs, and I think it's like the force is like K, in this case, delta Y, the change in Y or something, who cares? And so, what you end up finding is you do some math and find that the thing that pops out, this thing goes up and then it comes back down. And it goes up and it comes back down. You'll find that like it's you get a, no, well, no, no. Oh. Because you're assuming no friction. This is what I said, when you first start learning physics, you assume no friction. And so what you would have, and if there were no friction, right, if the spring were like infinitely, if it, if it never lost any heat, because, you know, as you move anything, it starts to heat up, and then you lose energy that way. Um, also, if we're here on Earth, there's air resistance, and so that's going to dampen the spring, right? That's what it's called, damping. And, but this, when you first learn it, you learn it as a harmonic, it's called a harmonic oscillator. And what it's going to do is it's just going to bounce back and forth forever, assuming no friction. And you spend a lot of time, your first year in physics, talking about f massless, frictionless things. Like, imagine a massless, frictionless pulley. You know, and like that's what you have to do to first do this. And so you imagine a, because the spring also can't have a mass for this to work out, because that changes everything and makes it hard. And so you have to imagine a massless, frictionless spring and a, a mass on the end of it which has no air resistance or anything like that. And you, you do the math and you find that, yep, you get sine of t. That's what happens. As time goes on, you get sine of t. 
And it'll be, of course, A sine T because it's not exactly going to be however many, whatever, right? But that's what you find. Then you throw in friction. And what you find, and there's like some factor where you say, okay, plus some friction. And now you do your math and you solve it. And what you find is that this thing looks like. It might not be the same k. I'm not sure about that. It might be some function of k. It might be like the square root of k. In fact, I think it is the square root of k. It's something like this. And so what you find is that, that in the real world, your mass is not going to bounce back and forth forever and ever. What's actually going to happen is it's going to be damped. And this is why it's called the damped harmonic oscillator. And so then what happens is that this thing just gets smaller and smaller until eventually it gets so small that it's not moving anymore. But then, of course, in the real world, it does stop. If you've ever played with a spring, you yeah. know that, yes, it does stop. So it reaches zero. And so, yeah, but this will never reach zero. So it's like, well, yeah, it's physics. That's why I hate physics. It's not real. None of it's real. No. Um, so that's, yeah, that's the idea. So these things pop up. And this one is called, and it's called the damped harmonic oscillator because it's a harmonic oscillator, so it's just going to bounce back and forth forever and ever and ever. But the, the magnitude of its movement has been damped. And these two bits that are dampening it are called the envelope. So. Um, and the last questions... Yeah, the last three... Uh, well, 163 is basically this thing, basically. And so you've already done it. Um, 61 and 65 are, they're, they're difficult, but again, like I do expect that you will check it with Desmos, but just try, like, hmm, how could I figure this out? It would be this and this, and I'd add this to it, and maybe it would do this kind of thing. Just, just try, and so, yeah, that's all I got, you guys.